<laughs> Welcome to my part of the uh, methods and ideas in psychology. Part of the course, I'm doing historical and conceptual issues, uh, most of which will concern the history of psychological ideas. And uh, not in this period, but in the next period and the one after, I'll try and start giving justifications why you have to do this course beyond it being a compulsory course and beyond it being a compulsory course because the British Psychological Society, when it validated the degree, said you have to teach a course in his historical and conceptual ideas. Now, many of you, some of you will go on to careers in psychology and you may join the august British Psychological Society and because they validate our degree, uh, uh, they say, stipulate the sorts of things which trainee psychologists must know about. So they, they have a big hand <coughs> in shaping our curriculum. Now, normally, and in this course, I shall speak quite frankly about some things. I think you're old enough to know the prejudices of your teachers. Basically, I think the British Psychological Society is a self-righteous, pompous, unnecessary institution. And on this one issue, the importance of historical and conceptual ideas, I think they got it right. But I should say why later. But I will warn you, this course isn't really like the other psych psychology courses. Because we're not dealing with latest facts. We're not dealing with empirical <coughs> studies. We're dealing with ideas. And it's important that you understand ideas. And that you feel at ease with ideas. And I shall also be talking about the history of ideas. And you've got to have a sense of the past to understand how we think now in the present. But I shall be saying more about this. We'll also be, there's also a strong, if you want, philosophical bias. And philosophy asks questions. It doesn't expect answers, and it certainly doesn't ex expect empirical answers. It gets you to wonder about what the problems are what underlying problems there are <coughs> to psychology. Now what I hope to do in this first session is not for me to stand up and tell you what I think. I think it's for you to sit round and discuss amongst yourselves what you think psychology is. Uh, I've got uh, several questions. How, how many of you did psychology a -level? Oh, it's the overwhelming majority. Thankfully, there's some of you who did proper subjects. <laughs> now, you, you who did psychology as, a, uh, at a, as an A-level, were you told very early on in your course, psychology is a science? Were you? And then you wrote it down, psychology is a science. You were told this as a what does it mean to say psychology is a science? If you say psychology is a science, that means you have some idea what a science is. The other thing, when you were told <coughs> psychology is a science, I expect you were told it as something you should applaud. Isn't it good to be a science? But psychology gains from being a science. But now, now you're all grown-ups, not A-level students. You can ask the question, not just what is a science, but should psychology be a science? Should it concern itself to be a science? And if it should, well, what makes it a science? And if you don't think it's a science, what would make it a science? What exactly is a science? <coughs> and then... And this is a key, uh, these are all questions I want you to 
discuss in this first session amongst yourselves, and also focus on another question which is related to it. These are the questions. Which is, if you have a science, say you have a science of zoology, you will assume that that science has a load of facts. The zoologists will know about the bigger <coughs> structure of different mammals, will know about insects, will know about their habitats and whatever, and be able to name uh, different animals. A chemist will know about chemical formulas and constituents of matter. Well, if psychology is science, do we have similar sorts of facts? And what are our psych psychological facts? Now, before I get into the topic of today's lecture, let me speak about the course. Uh, first of all, I've mentioned that uh, this course is unlike other courses. Now, I've written about this on the syllabus, and I would strongly advise you all to read the syllabus carefully, particularly the sections on assessment, but also the early session sections where I talk about the course. For many of the courses which you do, what you have to read are basically empirical reports, empirical studies. And sometimes you can read these without the full 100% concentration. You know uh, what a, a, an exp how an experimental report is structured and so on. <coughs> I, I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of you will read these standard empirical reports with music on, either in your ears or in the background, or hopping off to Facebook and coming back. Now, I would not recommend this style of reading for some of the material which I'm uh, wanting you to read, because it's about <coughs> ideas. It involves concentration. Like, it's almost like as if you were trying to solve a mathematical problem. You, you have to have real concentration. And the sort of reading I'm asking you to do is better to read a small amount slowly than a big amount quickly and superficially. I'm talking about ideas, and you have to grasp the basic ideas, and sometimes it may mean a bit of concentration to understand the basic ideas. And I shall also be asking you to read very old material, written in a different style than modern material. And again, it needs concentration. So if someone reads an enormous amount, but reads it very quickly, they probably won't get as much out of it as someone who reads less. So reads it slowly, and maybe reads it again and again. Textbooks are a bit different from the recommended readings. Uh, there's no single textbook for the course. I'm afraid I'm talking about things I'm interested in and things which I think every social psychologist or psychologist should look at. And I haven't found a textbook which covers everything. There's an excellent one for the early period from the 17th century. <laughs> <laughs> and I shall be talking about some of the views which I've expressed there. Uh, and that's the early, I mean early historical period. The later historical period, there's a book, and it hurts me to say this, but it's much better, even better than the first one. It's a superb book by Kirk Danziger. He's really talking about the making of modern psychology where experiments came from. And there's a, a really good book, a general history, which covers more of a history of psychology than I, I should be covering in this course, uh, by Graham Richards called Putting Psychology in Its Place. 
And basically, if you had to ask them, well, what really is the course about? It's topics in the history of psychology. How the topics developed, <coughs> how they were looked at. But I'm not doing it just to say how we got to the present, but also to understand in greater depth and historical depth the nature of psychology. Because my assumption is, and I'll say more about this next week, you cannot understand the present or even have a feel for what the future might hold unless you have a grasp of the past. If you only understand the present, you won't even understand the present. <coughs> And what I'm going to begin with today is not history. Well, there will be some history. But beginning with questions of the philosophy of science, which really are questions you all were talking about in your presentations and your discussions. Because none of you were talking empirically, saying, oh, we've done this study and we've done that study. You were asking a philosophical question, like, what is a science? And that philosophical question is a variant of the basic philo philosophical question which all philosophers have asked, which is, what is truth? How do we know that something is true or is not true? Well... <coughs> Let me start, as you all tell me to do, with the simple thing you're taught at A level, at university, which is like an assumption in the start of all textbooks in psychology. <coughs> psychology is a science. You'll find this in the introduction to social psychology textbooks. Chapter one, psychology, or introductory chapter, psychology is a science, and this means uh, 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 we're different from non-sciences. Last year, as you all know, I taught introduction to social psychology. That course this year is going to be taught by my colleague who's just arrived in, in the department, Susan Condor, and actually she begins with this. She's going to begin with this by quoting from textbook after textbook to all the students and, and quoting how they all start off, psychology is a science. Now, that sounds grand, but it's almost a meaningless statement. Unless you can say, what's a science? What makes a science? What's so good about a science? And also, what's a scientific fact? Does psychology have facts? These are questions which I'm going to be talking about. And I'm going to mention which, uh, the importance uh, of the work of one of the great philosophers of the last century, Karl Popper, who talked about the importance of refutation. And I'll just say something about his work because it's so important for understanding what a science might be. And his work and his philosophy of science, which suggests that aren't absolute scientific truths. But science is a much more complicated business than maybe the textbooks which say all oh, psychology to science imply. So I'm starting off with a number of questions. And philosophers have to start with questions. They don't start always with, fa with facts. They move, or if they start with facts, they move to questions. Is science and if it is, and this is, all of you have got some idea of this, what exactly makes it a science? <coughs> is it the experiments? Is it the statistics? Is it the observation? And in many of the textbooks, it's the assumption, an assumption you echoed quite, quite, quite rightly, that psychology uses scientific methodology, experiments, 
Well, is it true that all sciences use experiments like psychology does? And are the experiments which psychology uses rather strange sorts of experiments? Or is it the scientific analysis of results? You all have to slog through doing statistics. There may be one or two eccentrics amongst you who enjoy statistics. But for many who do psychology, it's a drag. Have any of you got friends doing physics or chemistry? Do they do statistics? I don't think so. Now, if psychology is a science, and it's part of science to have statistics, and physics and chemistry don't use statistics, does this mean they're not sciences? <coughs> not really. Well, we will assume that we have a scientific methodology, a way of analysis and analysis. Experiments, statistical analysis, and then we find scientific truths. But do we? Now, that assumes that science rests on the discovery of truth. And it's very easy for us to assume, and many of the textbooks do, that there's a contrast between scientific truth and untested, unscientific prejudice. But until you had the rise of science, and modern science really started in the 1500s, the <coughs> 1600s, until then, people lived in dark prejudice. <coughs> For instance, take the classic scientific discovery of Galileo and the Earth going round the sun. For centuries, people in different parts of the Earth, wherever they live, would wake up and see the sun on one side of their environment. Rising, we can watch it, rising in the east. I'm pointing over there. I don't think that is east. I think that's east. But anyway, it doesn't matter. And as the day goes on, the sun goes there, gets overhead at noon, and then carries on down there and disappears. <coughs> over the horizon in the evening. And it's quite natural for human beings, whether they grow up in <coughs> Europe or Asia or Africa, to assume there's this thing which gives light. And it moves. It moves around the earth. As we stand still, we see it moving. We see it moving. And Galileo came along and said, that assumption completely wrong. We think we're standing still, but we're not. We're on a planet which is moving about and spinning about, and it goes round the sun. It's an illusion to think the sun is travelling over us. And here's an example of scientific truth demolishing untested prejudice. Here's another one, William Harvey. People had known about the heart. I didn't quite know what it did until William Harvey in the 17th century said, it, the heart is a pump. It pumps blood round the body. And the blood comes back and it's pumped again round and round and round, uh, down the arms, down the legs, back from the legs to the brain and so on. And people said, oh, yes, yes, yes. And here's again an example. Facts displacing prejudice. Scientific facts displacing prejudice. 
as if this is what science does. It finds facts. Well, <coughs> that's too simple. Just to say, science produces facts and it gets rid of untested prejudice. First of all, we can ask, how did the facts replace prejudice? What happened? We all know that Galileo was persecuted by the church. Did it happen that Galileo and Harvey produced their scientific insights by using the sorts of things which experimental psychologists use, the experiments and statistics? No. Statistics, as we know, it wasn't invented in the time of either Galileo or Harvey. That came in the 19th uh, yeah, in the 19th century. <coughs> Did they use experiments, controlled experiments? <coughs> no. Galileo did it by observation. How could he have done an experiment? He said, well, what we need is uh, an experiment with two universes, one where the sun comes from uh, this side and goes that way, and we'll control it and have a control group where it goes that way. How can you do an experiment like that on the sun going round the earth? Or the earth going round the sun? No, it was observation <coughs> and no statistics. Well, we can ask the question, what are psychology's facts? And then we come to the key philosophical question. How do we know that something is true? Or is a fact, what we take for granted as a fact, not quite as true? as we might think it is. And look, these are all questions, apart from the second one. And it's questions which philosophers ask. They try and pro provide answers to the questions. Sometimes they think they've got just the answer. And another philosopher comes along and says, no, no, your answer's not good enough. You go back to the question again. Psychologists often claim to have outgrown <coughs> philosophy. Oh, psychologists all used to be philosophers. And many of the people in this course <coughs> talk about a primarily thought of philosophers. But I don't think psychology has or should outgrow questions about truth, about what we know. To say we outgrow it means, oh, we ignore it. We're going to not think about it. Now there's a big, big problem in the history of science <coughs> about facts, about knowledge, about being scientific. And the big problem is <coughs> what people assume is scientific, a scientific fact can change. What one age considers <coughs> highly scientific and true, another age can dispute. <coughs> and the great example of this is the theories produced by one of the greatest scientists of all time, Sir Isaac Newton and his theory of mass. Newton lived in the 1600s. Does anyone know where Newton came from? Oh, this is yes. so disappointing. Do you know why it's disappointing? Here you are all studying in the East Midlands. Most of you probably haven't come from the East Midlands. You've come from other parts. Britain and other places, and you've come to the East Midlands, and you don't know the name 
who at that we don't know, who probably was the greatest person to come from the East Indies, Sir Isaac Newton. Born not far from Melton Mowbray. Grew up there. It's a, it's a, it's a house what, in Walsthorpe. You can go and visit his birthplace. If any of you like cycling, you could get out for a night. He went when the sun comes back, if it ever will. <laughs> it doesn't seem to rise these days very often. Maybe next spring you could take your bicycle out for a 15, 20 mile ride and go and visit Newton's book. Oh, I'm getting distracted. <coughs> One great thing about history, as opposed to psychology, history encourages the telling of stories and seemingly <coughs> irrelevant facts. I shall get distracted uh, time and time again. Now, for 300 years, This rather odd man, Newton, from the East Midlands, from a rather poor background. His parents were just sort of small farmers, not big landowners. And he worked to, uh, on their farm when he was a kid. It, but his great ideas were accepted as scientific truth. But Newton had sorted out how the universe worked. And then in the early 20th century, it seemed to fall apart. Einstein came along with his great theory of relativity. Newton had imagined uh, a universe where things <coughs> like things fell according to gravity, according to particular laws. And Einstein said, well, no, it's not like that. It's not but what Newton ex accepted as true relations between things are much more problematic. Things, things only exist in relation to other things. And then uh, uh, another physicist, a great uh, a colleague of uh, Einstein, Heisenstein, uh, Heisenberg, came up with the principle of uncertainty that the very smallest elements of the world. You can't predict what they're going to do. It isn't because we can't observe them closely enough, they're too small to observe, but they are by their nature unpredictable. Newton thought everything could be predicted. And so, in the early years of the 20th century, Newton, whose great scientific work was questioned. <coughs> Theories of physics had to be written in the earth. What was going on? <coughs> Neither Einstein nor Heisenberg accused Newton, the son of poor parents, of being unscientific. They never said, oh, Newton, what an idiot Newton was. They never said that. Great respect for Newton. A genius. He devoted his life to trying to understand the world. But both said, certain respects, Newton was wrong. And this raises a huge philosophical problem. How is it possible for a theory like Newton's to be both scientific and wrong? Until then, people had assumed that science is just simply the discovery of truth. But after Einstein's theory of relativity, it becomes impossible to have that comforting belief. Because you say, Newton, one of the greatest scientific minds the world has ever known, was not entirely correct. He was wrong on certain things. So that it's possible to be scientific, brilliantly scientific, but wrong. And this really 
was the problem which Karl Popper, you see his dates, 1902, grew up uh, when when, when Newton's theory was being challenged. And he was a great defender of science and a real opponent of dogmatism. He is not someone who is anti-science at all. Very, or was very pro-science. Very much <coughs> opposed to people, religious fanatics, political extremists, who thought they could get rid of science. And his famous theory, which came from his study of this debate between Einstein and Newtonian physics, was to be scientific is to have the means to fortify, not the means to confirm. But I'll explain why this is, but some of you may already know, because I'm delighted to hear that as you, in your talks you talked about the importance of falsification. As a young man, uh, when, when, I think it was when he was at university, he took a summer job, and he wrote about it, Popper wrote about this in his autobiography. He worked as a researcher for someone who looked after children but also was a Freudian psychoanalyst. And Popper reported to his supervisor a difficult case of some young child who was deeply disturbed and the analyst said, ah, this sounds just like another instance of, of the young boy trouble with the Oedipus complex. An explanation. But it didn't really convince Papa. And he said, how do you know this boy, who you've not met, is the Oedipus complex, which is to blame. And the analyst said, it's my experience of a hundred previous cases which convinces me. And Papa said to him, Papa was an awkward son. There's no doubt about that. He said, and I suppose from now on you'll say it's your experience of 101 cases. And what he meant by that, of course, is that your 100 cases, your claim to have experience of 100 cases, is not convincing me. If all you do is say, ah, oh, it's the Oedipus complex, ah, oh, it's the Oedipus complex. Ah, oh, it's the Oedipus complex. You can count them all, 100, 101, 102, but it still doesn't convince me. And that made him think, what is wrong? What's going <coughs> wrong? When someone who claims <coughs> to be knowledgeable, claims even to be scientific, has a theory, and keeps finding evidence to confirm that. So the psychoanalyst would say, well, the Oedipus complex is so important for, 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 for young children, and if they're disturbed, it's wrong, so they haven't resolved the Oedipus complex, and here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. And Popper thought that the problem was looking for confirmation of the theory. Now, Popper's big problem wasn't so. Actually, he didn't think psychology was a science at all. He thought it was a pseudo-science, but I'm not going to go into that. It was physics. And it was this battle which was going on within physics. Newton versus Einstein. And you, for Popper, you have to understand that debate to, to, to know what it means to be scientific and what scientific practice should be, not what it necessarily what it is, but what it should be. <coughs> and most of the de definitions of science <coughs> in the textbooks, and until Popper wrote, were that science produces truth as opposed to fiction, or untested prejudice. And that then leads to the philosophical question, how do we know something is true? 
what test can we give of a theory to say it's true? An obvious question, you might think. But Popper's great brilliance in the history of the philosophy of science was to say something very simple. That is the wrong question. Because we never, ever know that something is absolutely true. We shouldn't be concerned with truth so much as error. Now, I'm going into philosophy. Please stop me at any point, not just in this lecture, but in any lecture I give, if I'm getting complicated. Because <coughs> some of the ideas which I'm talking about, and will be talking about, may be complicated. I don't mind explaining them again. <coughs> I've, tend to ch I've, I've chosen the topics I'll cover, and I choose them because I enjoy talking about them. So don't ever feel abashed about stopping me and saying, go over and that again, explain it. And for Popper, it can be, his views can be expressed concisely, but he's talking about the importance of falsification, <coughs> of trying to falsify a theory, to prove it wrong. <coughs> Not verification, or confirming it. You think that science is a matter of producing facts, and then verifying that these facts are facts. For Popper, he said, no, that's where science goes wrong. Always try to falsify. Take a question. This is one which Popper used. And it, it, it's a simple one. But, it, it, yeah, let's go. What colour are swans? All swans are white. If you were a biologist or a zoologist interested in animal behaviour, and you lived in the 1600s, you would have a law, you could say, all swans are white. If you see a swan-like uh, uh, duck or goose in the distance and it's not white, it won't be a swan. And biologists could assert that as a fact, all swans are white, before the discovery of Australia, where they found White swan, uh, uh, black swans. Now, okay, it, that's not the point. It's, imagine you're back in the 1600s. No one in Europe has ever seen a white swan. You ask yourself, how many swans do you need to see in order to state, as a general law, all swans are white? How many swans? to confirm this as a scientific fact. A hundred? A thousand? Should you go searching every river you can find? Go down the Thames, go down the Avon, go, go onto the continent, the, the Danube, the Rhine, the Seine, and look for swans and say, oh, they're white, they're white, they're white. I've seen 500. Hundred thousand swans and they're all white, therefore all swans are white. Oh, do I need another one, five thousand and one, a hundred thousand? You can't specify how many times you need to confirm a law or a fact to prove it as true. But one black swan, just one, disproves it all. Once the explorers, the European explorers, <coughs> could come back and say, well, you've seen the black swan. And draw a picture of a black swan. That disproves what everyone had thought to be a law. And you only treat this as saying something about the operation of science. It makes science a bit more problematic. How many times do you have to repeat an experiment to show that the findings from those experiments are true? How many <coughs> times do you have to confirm a theory? 
to say it's true. You can't specify what Popper said. You know, 100, 101, 102, it's meaningless. But you get the real big insight, not from the 103rd confirmation, but from the falsification. How many times did the scientists of the 18th century, the 1700s, all the early 1800s, have to confirm Newton for everyone to say, Newton is right, Newton is right. And in the 20th century, Newton's theory didn't seem to fit the new facts which were emerging. And Einstein would come in and say, no, this matter here, and this matter here, you was wrong. <coughs> Just like the, the explorers coming back from Australia could say, guess what? It's not true, all swans are white. And so Popper then said, what, what makes out a scientific theory from a non-scientific theory? Because <coughs> a scientific theory at least in theory, can be falsified. Not that it is falsified. It ceases to be a totally scientific theory if it's falsified, but what I meant by this <coughs> is that a scientific theory tells you something about not just what has happened to, to interpret evidence, but what should not happen if the theory is true. If the theory is true that all swans are white and whiteness is to do central to the identity, the biological identity of a swan, then it says that anything, if you find a black swan, that theory is incorrect. The theory has its own possibility of being falsified. And Popper says, this is the mark of a scientific theory as opposed to a prejudice. A scientific theory tells you what shouldn't happen as well as what should happen. And in, in theory, you should be able to design an experiment to try to falsify the theory and see whether what the theory says will and will not happen, actually does and doesn't happen. And this is the difference between science and prejudice. And indeed, between science and religion. People who have religious beliefs and have them for very deep reasons, and I should say that Newton was an incredibly religious man believed he was a very mystic man. So it's not a question you either have science or religion. Look at the history of science. Einstein believed in God. Well, actually, he equivocated, but, but basically he did. But Newton certainly was very religious. <coughs> but a religious belief, by and large, is not a scientific belief. You can't test it, because if you say, uh, I believe in an all-powerful, merciful God. You can't design an experiment, because if you design an experiment, you say, well, why doesn't God come down now and prove himself? Oh, look, he hasn't come down now, therefore there's no God. Someone will say, no, no. That is a stupid test of religion. No, no, no. In fact, there's no test of Popper said, this is what's different with science. For science to be a science, it must be testable. And it must be, in theory, proved wrong. If you make a statement, which in theory could not be disproved, and therefore tested, it's not scientific. So a scientist will say, this will happen if we do this. 
then other scientists will try and <coughs> test that in the most rigorous way they can. But if you said, my theory is so true, but it doesn't matter what you do, it's still true, you'll say, that's not a scientific theory. Do you understand what Popper's notion of something being falsified? Doesn't mean it has been falsified, it just means in theory it should be possible to falsify it. To test it. To test that it's wrong. And Popper said science has two real aspects. One is conjecture or, or imagination. There are scientists, the great scientists like Newton and like uh, Einstein, were very imaginative. As I say, Newton was a mystic. <laughs> but you formulate theories, you formulate hypotheses. You may use your imagination to do that. And then, not that you try and confirm them, you try to refute. If you try to confirm them, you'll just be gathering more and more white spots. Really, to test the hypothesis is to try and refute it, to search out its weak points, what the hypothesis cannot do. And what this means for Popper is a scientific theory is not a theory, but is <coughs> To say science is just a collection of absolute proven truths is to be wrong. It's to show no knowledge of the history of science. What we can say is we can have good theories. And what, what's a good theory? It's one that fits the known facts and has not yet been refuted. For a good number of years, Newton's theory was a good theory. It, it, it fitted the facts which were known about the universe, about matter, about gravity, and hadn't yet been refuted. And this means that Newton was the best theory of his time. Relativity, theory of relativity, one of the best theories of our times. But that is not to say that in the future, people will have more insight, physicists will have more insight, and will look back and say, yeah, relativity, brilliant idea, but not quite right. Not quite right. So we know what is wrong, but we never know what is absolutely right. And Popper's defense of science removed what many people thought was science's greatest strength. It removes the idea of scientific certainty. At least other problems were. It, it sounds too simple. You refute a theory. Well, what counts as re refutation? And the adherents of the old theory may still cling on to their theory. There were Newtonian physicists who, who, who <coughs> clung on against the, the onslaught of relativity. And they may deny the new facts, refute the theory, say, oh, we just changed the theory in a bit way, or this new evidence really isn't well done, and so on. <coughs> and science is contestable. It's not just a matter of one fact and another fact on another fact. There are arguments. There are different schools of thought. There are battles for supremacy, battles to convince young students that my approach is better than his approach. And all this, according to Popper, and later philosophers of science, goes on in the most scientific of scientific endeavors, in chemistry, in physics, in what of psychology. With this sort of background, can we unequivocally say psychology is a science? <coughs> Do experimenters try to refute their own theory? 
But if I just try and find examples to confirm. By and large, in psychology, theorists often do experiments to find effects which seem to confirm their own theoretical presuppositions. Do you remember last year you were lecture, uh, I think Christian Tiliaga talked to you about cognitive dissonance. Am I right? The idea that people feel uh, some sort of internal tension if they hold opposite views. And it really was uh, uh, Leon Festinger who formulated the theory of cognitive dissonance. <coughs> and what did the supporters <coughs> of the theory of cognitive dissonance do? They didn't ask the question, when will this theory not work? When are people not bothered by such contrasting views? But they sought to design experiments to show dissonance effects, to try and confirm that dissonance worked. In this sense, this isn't the action, the sort of action which Popper said is really scientific. Just trying to confirm my theory is better than your theory because I've got all these scientific facts which back my theory. And that's what a lot of social psychology is like. In this lecture, I've tried to pose questions about what a science is. To say that science is, the idea of a science and a scientific fact may be more complicated than we assume. And that this is true of physics, and if it's true of physics, it may be <coughs> even more complicated if we apply these ideas to psychology. But not something. To outline these theory, these ideas, I've had to make several historical arguments to explain Popper's theory. And it's a very great theory. I've had to put Popper in his time in the last century and put his time in terms of the debate between Newton and Einstein, or Newtonian physics and Einsteinian physics. And to understand that debate, I've had to go back very briefly to Newton and his time. And what this means is to understand the nature of science and how science is practiced. You have to look at the history of science the history of how theories have come into being and how they may go out of fashion or be refuted. And if this is true of physics, who no one, no one disputes the scientific credentials of physics or of Einstein or of Newton, how much more is this true of psychology? So to understand the big issues <coughs> in psychology, I believe, and I hope to convince you that you needn't be convinced, you all must have your own views, but I hope to make a case that you need to examine psychology historically to get more insight about the nature of psychology. Okay, as I say, yep, we can finish early. Any questions? Anything, particularly if there's anything I've said which you haven't grasped, please get me to say it again. And if I say something which you haven't grasped and don't want to ask it in the lecture, email. Okay, thank you.